Hello, and welcome to CPHF Talks. My name is Karen Croker, and I'm a gastroenterologist here at the University of Alberta, and I'm here to talk to you about stool tests. So first of all, in gastroenterology, we order a number of stool tests to help in the diagnosis of many conditions, including infection, inflammation, screening tests, as well as in terms of absorption or nutrition or nutritional status. So today, because there's so many tests, I'm just going to focus on three tests. Fecal calprotectin, which is used in the diagnosis and management of inflammatory bowel disease. Fecal elastase, which is used in the diagnosis of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency as well as the H. pylori stool antigen test. So first of all, I wanna say that nobody really likes to do stool tests. And so that's because you know, I mean stool tests can be embarrassing. You might be a little bit afraid of the results. There, um, sometimes there's just concerns about hygiene or, or um, un the, the, the unknown. And so we have found that when patients do understand what the benefit of the stool test and the result might mean for them, they're more likely to com comply. And so um, I hope that will help you understand. And today we wanna teach you about uh, the, a few stool tests today. So fecal calprotectin is the first test we wanna talk about. And this is a test for intestinal inflammation. And so inflammation is in your bowel often because this is a breakdown product of, an, of, of white blood cells. And so when you have inflammation, it can go up. It can be elevated in a number of conditions, not just inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and colitis, but it also can be elevated in celiac disease, in lymphoma, in food allergies. But it is important to remember that it is not elevated in an irritable bowel syndrome. And that sometimes it's used to distinguish between uh, inflammatory bowel disease versus IBS. Because sometimes patients with your IBD also have IBS, and so it's important to know which we're treating when we have the, when, and we can use this test to help figure it out. So what is an abnormal level of fecal calprotectin? So this is a stool test that's measured as a proportion or a concentration. And so it's, it's reported in micrograms per gram of stool. And so a normal fecal calprotectin is a, a value between less than 50 to 100 micrograms per gram. When the test is about 100 to 250, it's kind of in the indeterminate zone. And so it may be relevant, but it may not be. But when it's greater than 250, we're pretty confident that there's active intestinal inflammation. So people sometimes ask, can you actually use a fecal calprotectin to replace endoscopy? And I think their big answer is probably sometimes. So sometimes, depending a little bit on what uh, the result is and depending on the, the circumstance, it can replace endoscopy. So when your fecal calprotectin is really low and we're trying to distinguish, are your bowel symptoms related to um, Crohn's disease or do you have irritable bowel syndrome? Sometimes we can use the fecal calprotectin and be reassured that you do not have IBD and that we, we don't need to move on to colonoscopy. Sometimes in inflammatory bowel disease, we do colonoscopies for other reasons, either to screen for uh, dysplasia or precancerous changes, or else because sometimes the fecal calprotectin and the symptoms of the patient don't correlate. So it's hard to know which one is the truth. And so in general, we find that the endoscopy is the, the most valuable test or the gold standard test for uh, the diagnosis of IBD, but we do use a we do fecal calprotectin to help assess for mucosal healing. We assess for the trend in it to make sure that things are going down when people start treatment. And so this is a really important test and has been really helpful in us helping us manage inflammatory bowel disease. The other question that sometimes people ask is why can't I just do a blood test? And so we do actually have a blood test for inflammatory bowel disease called the CRP or the C-reactive protein. And this is actually quite valuable for us also when we're following the response to treatment. The difference is between a fecal calprotectin and a CRP is that the CRP can um, represent inflammation in your entire body. It might be re related to your joints or could be from an infection but we know that a fecal calprotectin is for your bowel. And so it could be a bowel infection, but we do know that it is elevated in, in the bowel conditions only. And so it's not related to a skin infection or some, some other type of urinary tract infection that you might have. Next, we wanna move over to the next test, which is called the fecal elastase test. 
And in this test is used for the diagnosis of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So the reason I call it exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is because the pancreas actually has two functions. Endocrine function is actually when it produces insulin and that's used in the management or in how we diagnose diabetes. But the exocrine function is actually it releases a digestive enzymes which will help in the, man in the digestion of food. And so when you have pancreatic insufficiency, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, you don't cr um, create enough of those digestive enzymes to help you with digesting your food. And this can lead to malnutrition, weight loss, bloating, and, and, uh, and what's something called steatorrhea or fat in your stools. So in comparison to fecal caprotectin, fecal elastase is abnormal when it's low. And so a low level is when it's less than 200 micrograms per gram of stool. And that's because we need those enzymes to digest our food. And so it's an, it's an example of how we don't have enough of that. So there are a number of conditions that can cause you to have a pancreatic insufficiency. One could be because you had a pancreatic surgery or resection of your pancreas. The most common cause though is chronic pancreatitis, uh, which we often see in gastroenterology. And there is a number of causes for chronic pancreatitis. And these include things like gallstones, alcohol, um, pancreas divism, and there's a number of different causes of, of chronic pancreatitis. We also can see a pancreatic exocrine in insufficiency in conditions like cystic fibrosis as well as in hemochromatosis. And there's other rare kind of causes of it, including some genetic causes and other conditions that are a little more complicated. But it's important to remember that the most common cause of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency is actually um, chronic pancreatitis. So the symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency that uh, can lead to testing would be sometimes people have mild symptoms, and this could be just a little bit of bloating, usually without a change in their um, bowel symptoms at all. The second kind of symptom that people can have if it's moderate to severe is that can, they can get diarrhea and something called steatorrhea, where we often see that the stools are, are really stinky, as well as they, there seem to be a, like, there can be a, 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 a droplets of oil on the water in the, in the toilet as well as um, they can be quite difficult to flush. And so often when you're not absorbing your fat, that's when patients can actually are at risk for um, malnutrition because they're not able to absorb those nutrients. So they could be quite thin, as well as you can get um, fat soluble vitamin um, deficiencies. So again, the question comes up whether or not you can actually do a blood test instead of a stool test, because people generally prefer to do blood tests over stool tests. And there is a, a blood test for um, pancreatic insufficiency. It's called a serum trypsinogen, which is actually, um, but it's not quite as sensitive and it's not as good of a test as the, the fecal elastase. And that's why we generally rely on the fecal elastase. There are a couple of other tests that we sometimes do for, uh, to look for steatorrhea. And so that would be a, a Sudan stain, it's a, a stain of your stool for like a fat globules. And then that there's the dreaded 72 hour fecal fat test. As you can imagine, you collect your stools for 72 hours and then they analyze for an amount of fat. And during that time, you have to ingest a, a high amount of fat in your diet to, to see whether or not it's kind of a stress test for your bowel to see if they can absorb fat. Now, the third test we want to talk about today is the H. pylori stool antigen test. So what is H. pylori? So H. pylori is a chronic infection of the stomach lining, which is a spiral-shaped organism that you, we can see on uh, endoscopy when we take biopsies. And so this um, is a really important infection because it's known to be uh, associated with uh, gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers, as well as gastritis. And it's also associated with conditions like lymphoma and gastric cancer. So we believe it's really important for us to diagnose this and also to treat it. And just to reiterate how important this uh, infection is, in 2005, uh, Marshall and Warren won a Nobel Prize in physiology uh, for the discovery of this organism and the, its role in GI diseases. And I think that really play, shows you how important it is that this discovery and the fact that we have, are able to now diagnose this and treat it.
So the treatment of this condition is actually quite complicated. And so because it's a bacterium and it's actually subject to a lot of um, what we call bacterial resistance or antibiotic resistance. And so you need to take uh, often a combination of antibiotics as well as a proton pump inhibitor for usually two weeks to make sure that you can adequately treat it. So the treatment does vary a little bit depending on what region you live in, just because that local resistance patterns of the bacteria can vary. And so it's important to follow the local guidelines. Furthermore, because it's such an important infection, we actually often rule out, do a test to rule out um, to make sure that you've eradicated this bacterium because we wanna make sure that um, you're not continuing to be at risk from the uh, conditions that you can get associated with this infection. So in general, we find that there's um, two types of tests that we can use to diagnose H. pylori. First is an endoscopic test, which is an invasive test, where you do endoscopy and biopsies, which we uh, often do, especially when we find uh, ulcers, when we are scoping people and uh, find this condition, or we find um, evidence of gastritis. We wanna make sure that we treat this. And then there's a few non-invasive tests. And so the first non-invasive test we're talking about today is the stool antigen test, which is actually a test that is actually really good because it can not only diagnose the H. pylori, but it's good to make sure that you've eradicated that H. pylori. So there's two other non-invasive tests that we sometimes do. One is a blood test. And the blood test sometimes people would like to prefer to do, but it can only really confirm a, an infection or a past infection. It cannot um, tell us that it's been eradicated. It just says that at some point in time, you had H. pylori. Now, the third non-invasive test is a urea breath test in which you ingest a, a substance and then they actually measure your, um, the amount of urea in your breath over a certain period of time to see whether or not you have evidence of H. pylori. And so this is a, actually a very good test. You can also use for diagnosis and for determined eradication, but it's a little more expensive. And so that's why people have gone more to this dual antigen test. The one thing to remember is that because this is an infection and often um, that uh, acid can a little bit suppress it or medications can suppress the acid, that we actually, you need to be off antibiotics as well as off proton pump inhibitors when you get these tests done to get the best result, the most accurate result. Mm -hmm.